All right, everybody. We are going to start, and thanks to you all. I'm at 56 subscribers, so it is according to this, we are live right now. So I can see right now the lighting is bad. There's backlighting there and whatever, but here we go. Um, let's pray together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you today wanting to glorify your name, to lift up your name to the heavens. You are our creator. Our Lord Christ is our redeemer and our Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit is our comforter and teacher. May you, the triune God, be present with us today as we look at how we can better stand for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's been a month since we were together. We had two weeks of, um, of uh, missions emphasis. And so now we're going to dive back into where we were. So just a tiny little review of review, because this today perhaps will be the last day of review and emphasis from the previous class two years ago. So I started, we, we looked, uh, we started with the apologetics of Jesus and Paul. Remember, I'm using them as examples. That is the, that's the point of this. So um, I think that these characters in the Bible, Jesus, Peter, uh, Paul, and even Philip, Philip has a tremendous apologetic encounter in the book of Acts, which we will look at in a bit. So we talked um, all about uh, the several encounters that Christ had. We talked about um, his advantage as being God. We talked about um, the different encounters he had, some hostile, some favorable, and how Jesus answers each differently. We understand that uh, Jesus has that distinct advantage of being the second person of the Trinity. But I also have emphasized last time and this time that uh, we have the mind of Christ, according to Paul and Corinthians. So we ended last session with this um, discussion that Paul has, this conversation that Paul has with the Corinthians and how he runs through these, um, this stack of, of uh, statements that says, if this doesn't happen, then the resurrection is possible. And the implication is, if the resurrection is not possible, then Jesus didn't get raised. And if the resurrection is not possible, then you won't be raised in your family. And it, and it goes on and on and on like that. So now we're going to go with him to Corinth, where he first gave this, uh, where he first taught this message. And I am stunned, you know, you and I, we read the Bible and sometimes we see things 40 years later that we didn't notice the first time. Right? Well, here's one of those moments for me, maybe for you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, this great chapter on the resurrection, he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 of the brethren, and it goes on. But notice that he's the, it's not just the first thing in terms of primacy, like logical importance. He says, I delivered to you first of all. Like the first thing he talked about was the cross of Christ. He didn't get to it a year later. Now you think, okay, fine. He's going to the synagogues. He's talking to people who know the Old Testament. He's talking to... Um, Jewish people who have some association, some understanding, some connection that Paul has. They're starting at some universal point. And that is somewhat true. But would you look at Acts 18, please? Look at Acts 18. <clears throat> and you'll find that while Paul did go to the synagogues, that's not the only place he went. And his message to the people, whether they were Jews who understood the Old Testament or were at least familiar with it and accepted it as the word of God, 
Um, that is not the only place he went, and those are not the only people he spoke with. So we're going to spend a long time today in a lot of scripture, mostly reading some comments, discussion, and, and I hope some interaction from you. So first of all, Paul in Corinth, this is Acts 18. After this, Paul left Anth Athens and went to Corinth. If you know the geography, Corinth is uh, west of Athens across um, a tiny little uh, isthmus, a tiny little connection between the, the southwestern parts of Greece, which is all sort of shaped like, like this. It's fingers of land, and it's connected through a very, very tiny little isthmus. And um, so Paul is heading west from Athens. Uh, and he found a Jew, so he does find a Jew, named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them because he was this, of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So first of all, notice that he does maintain his normal pattern of going into the synagogue. That's sort of his home base. But remember in Athens, he had gone right to the hill of the philosophers, the Areopagus, Mars Hill, and talked directly to the leading people of the city of Athens. So I'm sure he went to the synagogue in Athens, but he did not shy away from the academy. He did not shy away from the university. He did not shy away from the place where learned people went to discuss the things of the day. But he also... We also notice that there were uh, non-Jews in the synagogue. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So his audience is broader than just Old Testament uh, Yahweh-fearing Jews who had acquaintance with um, the scriptures of the Old Testament. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word and testified to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Big division, a change of Paul's ministry. And he left there and went to the house of a man named uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Now look where his house is. And his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So clearly in this number, there are those who are Jews and those who are non-Jews, what the Bible generally refers to as Greeks or Gentiles. But let's just go back and look at this scripture again. The primary thing that Paul delivered was Christ crucified. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen, etc. And 500 witnesses to his resurrection. Now, obviously to the Jews, he would have less scripture to explain uh, than a, a Gentile. But he still has to explain. He still, I mean... The, the folks on the road to Emmaus that walked with Jesus knew the Old Testament, but Jesus had to explain the relevant passages of the Old Testament to them. Beginning at Moses, he explained to them all the law and the prophets, how they pointed to him. So Jesus had to do that himself to Jews who, according to Jesus' own words, when he spoke to Nicodemus, you should know this. Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? So even there, Christ doing apologetics on people that ought to have known and understood and believed, Jesus still had to explain how his life had to be in order to redeem his people. Well, Paul is doing the same thing with Jews and with Greeks, with, let's say, the people of the covenant and the people who were initially outside the covenant, but now through Christ are in the covenant. Let's continue on with Acts 18. Uh, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, do not uh, go on speaking, do not be silent, for I'm with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. It doesn't specify whether they are Jews or Greeks or Romans 
or barbarians or Scythians or whatever. God tells Paul, I have many people in this city. They, they are my people. And he stayed a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was pro proconsul of Achaia and Jews, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, when he was about to take a stand, when he was about to defend himself, when he was about to do apologetics, Gallio steps in. He says to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a mad, it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they, the others, not, not Gallio, seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So just as an aside, Gallio is not really interested in justice when he allows a person to be beaten right in front of him. Ah, whatever, go ahead. I don't care. It's just, it's just deal with it yourselves. So clearly, as another aside, the idea that Rome and Greece are the pillars or foundations of Western justice, of law, of the rule of law, that is a complete fallacy in myth. The society we live in today is 100% demonstrably a Christian society. It is built upon the word of God. It is not built upon the word of Rome or Greece. Two years ago, I had several of these purchased for you. And I don't know if you still have it somewhere, those of you that were in the class. But this book, Christ and Civilization, is breathtaking in its brevity and its profundity. Let me read to you a little bit about the world that Paul lived in. World Book Encyclopedia. The principles that bound the Roman Empire together, justice, tolerance, and a desire for peace, influenced countless generations. First sentence. But the very next sentence, so startling in contrast to the first, is closer to the truth. Roman cruelty and greed caused great misery, and the use of force brought hardship and death. Two sentences back to back in the World Book Encyclopedia. Which one are we to believe? Let me read them back to back without the inter, uh, without the commentary in between. The principles that bound the Roman Empire together, justice, tolerance, and a desire for peace, influenced countless generations. Roman cruelty and greed caused great misery, and the use of force brought hardship and death. There's no rule of law. There is no justice. There is no... Uh, Ten Commandments, there is no respect for individuals, for property rights, for anything like that. That is a Christian and a holy Christian idea. Going on, this is again Paul's world. These are the people that Paul went to in Corinth. Roman and Greek religions were very different from Christianity, not only in their polytheism, or more accurately, polydemonism, but in that, the pagan religions did not emphasize knowledge, learning, understanding, and teaching. They had no sermons, no books to be studied, no body of doctrine to believe. The chief object of pagan religions were to foretell the future, to explain the universe, to avert calamity, and to obtain assistance of the gods. They contained no instruments of moral teaching analogous to our institution of preaching or to the moral preparation for the reception of the sacrament, or to the confession, or to the reading of the Bible, or to religious education, or to united prayer for spiritual benefits. One result of this anti-intellectualism was, of course, that religious piety was, was expressed in religious behavior, attending temples, offering sacrifices, making pilgrimages. For the Greeks valued orthopraxy, that's right practice or doing the right thing, rather than orthodoxy, which is teaching or believing the right thing. In all this, Greek religion reflected and supported the general ethos of Greek culture. 
it discouraged individualism. It emphasized the sense of belonging to a community and of the need for the observance of social forms. Greece informed those em and enforced those emphases with death. Who is the most famous person in the history of Greece to be executed for atheism? Socrates. By the decree of the Athenian council, he was sentenced to death by drinking hemlock, a poison, because he refused to acknowledge the Greek gods. So he was accused of atheism, and he was executed for it. Greece enforced these emphases with death. If you don't believe, you die. A little bit more. The name of the Greek city of Corinth, the center of religious devotion, became synonymous with sexual immorality. To Corinthianize was to engage in the most perverted and debauched sexual practices. The Greek and Roman gods and goddesses were men and women larger than life. They fought, they schemed, they lied, they got drunk, they raped, and they committed incest. The Romans worshipped 12 major gods and goddesses and thousands of lesser gods which had arisen from the animism of early Rome. There were gods for war, fertility, love, harvest, travel, doors, ad infinitum. Each god and goddess had his or her own sphere of influence, his or her own department, and the devout Roman or Greek did not worship one god to the exclusion of others, but worshipped each as circumstances demanded. Here is what the life of a Corinthian or a Roman was. A succession of spirits watched over each period of a man's life from birth to death. Uno Lucina, Candelifera, and Carmentes aided at birth. It was Vagitanus only who could inspire the first cry. Cuninia guarded the infant in its cradle, giving place to Cuba when the small Roman tamed the distinction of a bed. By Rumina, he was taught to take his mother's milk. Edusa and Potaina watched over him in the days of his weaning. Fabulinus taught him to talk, Statilinus to stand. Abeona and Adeona attended him in, in his first ventures from the house. Catius sharpened his wits. Sentia deepened his feeling, while Volumna stiffened his will. Viduus parted body and soul. And on and on and on it goes. This is the world into which Paul uh, was placed by the Holy Spirit. And it is this world where Paul said, first I delivered to you that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And of course, just like Christ explained to the apostles, he explained to whomever was in his audience the scriptures. We went through a lot of Acts 18. I just want to make mention that Apollos uh, was a vigorous debater. And he was using scriptures to, to teach the Jews in the synagogue that Jesus is the Christ. Well, let's move on to the Philippian jailer. This is actually earlier in the story, uh, earlier in Paul's journey. In Acts 16, we find, uh, and I, I, you might remember this from last time, two years ago. Sirs, he says, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. But it just doesn't end right there, right? They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. It was after Paul and Silas had evangelized, had taught, had instructed, had, had talked to a Philippian Gentile, Greek, non-Jew, who did not know the word of God, did not know the Old Testament. What did Paul and Silas do? The first thing I did to you is to explain the cross of Christ. This is apologetics in action. This puts the emphasis that Paul said, I preached Christ and him crucified, back where it belongs. When you follow these examples, and remember, we'll read more of this at the very end of today, if you... If you remember, it is 
always the work of God and not ours. There's a great quote from Luther coming up that explains that uh, in detail. Um, I was going to read a little bit from uh, from, six, from chapter 16, um, but I think for the sake of time, we won't. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and read Acts 16 so you can get the full context. But again, the point that I'm making is that Paul spoke to people who didn't know the Bible about the Bible, and he taught them. And if they listened, they listened. And if they didn't, Paul shook his garments and, and uh, went on his way. And that seems to our 21st century notion harsh, unloving, not seeker sensitive, but it is the method of God's people as recorded for us in the Bible. <clears throat> Here's another one from Acts 16. This is what Paul would do in his spare time when he's not making tents, he's out preaching. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, not the synagogue, where prayers were customarily made in India. People go to the rivers and pray all the time, right? So this practice is not unique to Greece. It's not unique to uh, probably any culture in the world, but certainly uh, in India and here in Greece, people go down to the river and they make their prayers. If you don't have a river, maybe you're in the mountains of T uh, Tibet and Nepal, and you string prayer flags, and the, the, the wind takes the, the prayer from your flag and, and uh, blows it to the heavens. Um, so Paul goes to the river where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. One of the people they spoke to was Lydia. The Lord opened her heart. They explained things to her. She became a believer. In Athens, you know this story. Paul's going to use the ad hominem twice. He's not going to affirm the Athenians in their mythology, but he's going to grab a hold of something that they see as an object of worship or value and turn it around and present Christ through that. So he uses the ad hominem, which remember the phrase just means to the man. And it means um, the way we're using it is it means to accept for the sake of argument, another person's position, and then turn it back on them so you can use what they already have stated they agree with to, again, to promote or exalt Christ. So in verse 23, he says, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So he grabs a hold of this. He doesn't say that there is an idol named the unknown God. He says, I'm going to give that person, that God, a name. His name is Jesus. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. He takes their point of view, grabs a hold of it, gives it a new identity, and says, here is Jesus. Here's the second one. <clears throat> For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. For we are his offspring. Paul, as you know, was a very educated uh, man, and um, so he had read somewhere in his in his learning days. He read something by a Greek or a Roman uh, poet, and he grabbed a hold of it. He says, "You know what? There's this poet that you revere, and he said we are God's offspring. Well, let me tell you about that God that you claim to be the children." Isn't that amazing? It's just like taking the unknown God and saying, I'm going to give you, give that unknown God a name. His name is Jesus. I want to get out of this for a minute. I want to show you some uh, versions, shall we say, some, some varying translations. Well, I don't know if you can see that. That's really small. Let me see if I can increase this. I can. Look at that. So I read for, for you from our um, ESV. I read for you, no, I read for you from the um, King James, New King James. I like the way these first few uh, translations really emphasize by putting a period in the middle of the sentence instead of a comma or a semicolon. NIV. For in him we live and move and have our being, period. 
as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. See how that emphasis um, clarifies that Paul is using a quotation from outside. He's saying, you know, by the way, there's this poet. He says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Same thing with the new living. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Very, very, uh, very similar to the NIV. That really emphasizes how Paul takes their idea, turns it around, and gives it back to them. That is the use of the non-abusive, just the normal ad hominem, where you take it to the man. You direct your argument to wherever the person is. So we've been through <clears throat> these already. And now we're going to move on from Paul. We talked about Paul's logical brilliance. Now we've seen how Paul adapts himself to the situation that he's in. Remember, Paul's the one who said, anything I have to do, and of course he's not including immorality, but he says, I will do anything, I will become anything to anyone for the sake of the gospel. Um, in a sense, this is a stretch, but in a sense, that's like a, a boss or a manager who is not so proud as to not do the work that he assigns to a worker. If the toilets need to be cleaned, the manager goes and cleans them. Not to take away uh, you know, the janitor's job, but if it just needs to be done, it's that idea of seeing a job and going and doing it and not being so proud. Not uh, being, being willing to get your hands dirty when, well, there's somebody else that's supposed to do that. I'm supposed to sit behind my desk and make phone calls and look busy or hire and fire, or whatever. But it's that same principle. Paul is saying, I'll do whatever it takes. Of course, not involving immorality or lying or anything like that. But I'll do whatever it takes to get that gospel message forward, just to put it out there for, for um, God's people to see. And the reason he'll do that with boldness is because there are people in this city that belong to me, says the Lord. That's what energized Paul. I don't, I don't think he was probably counting church membership. He said, there's God's people everywhere. I'm going to go find them. Isn't that amazing? We want, we want success. We want numbers. We want, we want to show, like a missionary, right, who goes to the field uh, maybe it's a difficult foreign field, and the churches back home say, oh, you know, you've been there 15 years, and you only got three people that have, have come to the Lord. I, I think we're going to pull you back from the mission field because you're not being effective. You're not being, can you imagine if, if that had happened to Paul? First of all, Paul would say, no, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going because this is my my call from the Lord. But we put these emphases on numbers and results when the mission is to go and make disciples, anyone who is uh, anyone who is going to come to the Lord will. Yes. Well, you're putting a number on it. How does anybody know who was touched? Well, if you look at the Westminster Confession, it talks about the invisible church and the visible church, and it says we are to preach uh, the word and. Our building, not the, not the physical building, but the building that is filled with the people. The people are the visible church. Now, you and I know pretty much everybody in the church, and there's very good evidence from the um, lives lived that the people involved in this church are truly regenerate children of God. But the possibility exists that someone in this church body is not a genuine believer. And so that's my emphasis, is, is the, what Paul is saying. I am going to speak, I'm going to preach the word, and God's people will come. So even though I can't, you can't, I can't, nobody can truly number the members of God's invisible church because that is left to the counsel of God, uh, we still preach the cross indiscriminately. Um, 
I don't know if that exactly answers your question, Louis, but it's but it's in the right right zone, I think. All right, um, let's look at Peter. Peter, as you know, is impetuous. He is bold. He is confident. Um, and after the resurrection, he's really a changed man. Not entirely, but he does well. Um, we're running out of time. I wish I could tell, walk you through Acts 2. But in Acts 2, he preaches this amazing sermon. It's just brilliant. It recounts Israel's history and God's gracious superintending to a favorable audience. He just goes through and he talks about scripture and then he talks about Jesus and he says, you people killed him. They were cut to the quick and repented. Scripture is his, is his essential apologetic material. That's where he goes. The result is the first mass conversion in the history of the Christian church. Now let's look at Stephen. He is a martyr for Christ. He preaches a sermon in Acts 7. He recounts Israel's history and God's gracious superintending to a hostile audience. His material and his sermon is very similar to Paul's, or to uh, Peter's. But his audience is hostile. And instead of being cut to the quick and asking for repentance and forgiveness, oh, by the way, scripture is his essential apologetic material, but the result of the same sermon, essentially, is his being the first martyr in Christian history. So let me just back it up. Peter tells Israel's history. Scripture is his focus. The result is the first mass conversion. And with Stephen... He tells Israel's history, scripture is his material, and he's murdered for it. It's a brilliant example of contrasts, and it shows you how God's word accomplishes what it intends. The first time was to great benefit for the church. The second time was to end uh, Stephen's life. I don't know if there's any indication of what Peter was saying, but I know that Stephen was saying, this is who you crucified. He was kind of laying it right on the oh, yeah. Jewish authority. And he was. Being, I don't know that the Peter ever went to the people he was talking to when 3,000 folks got converted. Here's Acts. Here yeah, here's Acts 2. Let all the house, this is right at the end of Peter's, Peter's, not Stephen's sermon, Acts 2 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucify. Now, Stephen's sermon is more aggressive. Stephen is definitely, uh, he knows he's preaching to a hostile crowd. I don't know if Peter knows that he's preaching to a favorable crowd, but he does stand up and he say, these people are not drunk, right? He says, wait a minute, wait, wait, listen to me, people. And then he explains scripture to them. Well, we looked at 1 Peter. Now let's look at a second Peter example. In Acts 3, let's take that out. I don't have it all on the screen. In Acts 3, 1 through 26, I'm going to read and comment. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, faith is in the name of God's servant. Oh, go, go to verse 13. Sorry, I skipped. I forgot to read here. He says, go, go uh, to verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran together with them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. They're proclaiming Christ's name. They're doing apologetics by proclaiming Christ's name. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. There's more testifying to scripture, to Christ. To this, we are his witnesses. We are his apologists. And by his name, by faith in this name, in the name of Jesus, <clears throat> faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. They were ignorant in what they did. The command to those who hear Peter and John's words are repent. And some probably did. But they were also charged not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And they were beaten. Well, we've looked at an example of Peter. We looked at 2 Peter. And now let's look at 3 Peter. Acts 4.10. He is, let's go ahead and look at uh, the whole context here, starting in verse 8. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, Peter and John, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name given uh, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. When they had an opportunity, they spoke the word and they defended Christ. I've known nothing among you except Christ crucified. That is their testimony. All right, we are coming to an end of today's session. So let's take one look at a figure that we often forget, because this is pretty much the only time we really know much about Philip or learn much about Philip. He went on a Gaza trip. Now, I typed that up three weeks ago before the war in the Gaza Strip occurred or began. So I'm not trying to make light or fun of uh, a situation that is, that is horrific uh, in Israel. Um, but Philip did go down to Gaza. <clears throat> I wish we had time to examine uh, a lot of this story by, by reading more of it in detail, but we need to uh, press on. So Philip is directed by an angel of the Lord to be in the right place at the right time to intercept the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember the story he's told to, to go down. He, he, um, he goes down to Gaza and he meets this guy in the desert. He overhears the eunuch reading from Isaiah and he asks if he understands. The eunuch says, well, no. I don't. <clears throat> we shall see if we can find this. So 826. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go to the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. He's clearly a, either a Jew or a converted Gentile. 
He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returned. Oh, by the way, that's very much like um, uh, the young men in Babylon, right? Daniel and his friends. They were promoted to positions of great authority, not by compromise, but by obedience to God. Some, I'm sure, lost their lives. Some, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, were rewarded and placed in positions of high authority to the point of being essentially number two in the kingdoms, whether it's Babylon or uh, uh, the Persians and Medeans. So the message there is that we can, and it's not easy, believe me, it is, I'm not suggesting this is a simple thing to do, but the message there is that we can thrive in a hostile environment where we or our brethren or whatever are persecuted or reviled or whatever, but if we stand, and again, I'm not suggesting this is easy, if we stand, we can be recognized and in that um, uh, rewarded. This eunuch was in charge of the queen of Ethiopia's treasure, her main accountant. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up into the chariot to sit with him. Now the passage he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation and justice, the justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning here, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And then he's converted and baptized. He took where the, where the Ethiopian eunuch was. He answered him beginning at that scripture, and then he explained to him Christ. <coughs> now, just a refresher about Philip. Let's take a look at where Philip started. John 14. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, there's several different ways you can read this. I'm going to read it with compassion. Jesus said to him, have I been with you for so long, and yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? I don't know if that's how Jesus spoke to him. Uh, there's no way to know whether he was being sarcastic or a little prodding or a little abrasive, maybe. But there is, there can be a lot of compassion in that delivery, in those words. Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? This is the Philip who ran alongside the chariot and preached the gospel of Jesus by reviewing Old Testament scriptures to the Ethiopian. That's a tremendous model. Well, let's bring this to a close. I'm going to give you several quotes, several pieces of scripture, um, just to sort of wrap everything up. Remember the goal, not only of today's class, which is to talk about the apologetics of just four just four of the apostles. The, the goal of last time's class was to talk about how Jesus did apologetics himself. But the goal of the entire class is to point us to Scripture as our example and as our method for teaching, for evangelizing, for doing apologetics. So here is the conclusion of the matter. Follow the word. So long as I follow the word, follow me. If I leave off following the word, you leave off following me and follow the word. Some of you know that Emily uh, did short-term missions in Guatemala and Kenya and was two years in Kenya. Floyd Grinstead was an Indiana farmer 
and uh, a member of the Bible Presbyterian Church <clears throat> and a dedicated uh, saint assisting those who wanted to go overseas to do missions work. Floyd was a simple man. He was a farmer. He worked hard in the fields and he wore overalls and dirty clothes. That was his occupation. And I'll never, and he said this all the time, that's why I know it, but he was famous for this. Follow the word. So long as I follow the word, you follow me. If I leave off following the word, you leave off following me and follow the word. Here's Wycliffe. All law, all philosophy, all logic, and all ethics are in Holy Scripture. In Holy Scripture is all truth. Every Christian ought to study this book because, because it is the whole truth. Scripture alone, this is Luther, is the fount of all wisdom. Scripture alone must remain the judge and master of all books. Whoever does not consult Scripture will know nothing whatever. Nothing except the divine words are to be the first principles for Christians. All human words are conclusions drawn from them and must be brought back to them and approved by them. Start with scripture, do your business, come back to scripture and make sure you're on the right track. Follow the word. If you leave off following the word, or if I leave off following the word, you leave off following me and come back to the word. Make your work approved by the word. Luther, this is a long quote on a couple different slides. It is with the word that we must fight. By the word we must overthrow and destroy what has been set up by violence. The world sets itself up with power, with violence, with force. Luther, I will not make use of force against the superstitious and unbelieving. No one must be constrained or forced. Liberty is the very essence of faith. I will preach, discuss, and write, but I will constrain no one. Or faith is a voluntary act. God's word should be allowed to work alone without our work or interference. Why? Because it is not my power to fashion the hearts of men as the potter molds the clay. I can get no further than their ears. Their hearts I cannot reach. And since I cannot put faith into their hearts, I cannot, nor should I, force anyone to have faith. That is God's work alone. We should preach the word, but the results, the results must be left solely to God's good pleasure. Here's some scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, including the work of apologetics. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And I want to point something out really quickly. Notice it says, the word of God is living and powerful. It's talking about uh, something in the third person. But look in the fourth sentence or the fourth line down, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. The writer of Hebrews moves seamlessly from the word as a concept to the word as Christ. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. In the same in the same sentence, in the same paragraph, we move from the concept of the word to the word being identified as Christ. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, having girded your waist with truth, put on the breast, breastplate of righteousness. Shod your feet with the gospel of peace. Take the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Normally, I like to end with the Bible, but let's end with Spurgeon. Open the door and let the lion out. He will take care of himself. The way to meet infidelity is to spread the Bible. The answer to every objection against the Bible is the Bible. So we have, I think, successfully live streamed this for the first time. I'll find out later today. I recorded it and did a live stream. It should be on YouTube so you can review this. Two of the previous three talks are already there on YouTube. The videos are. I'm not going to edit them. They're just raw and up there ready to see. To, uh, next week, if you could please bring a notebook, a, a ring binder, um, maybe some, some paper that can go in it, and some index cards. Next week, I'm going to give you the first of our allegorical stories, and we're going to break them down and find out how we answer those specific objections starting next time. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name for giving to us the word of God. Burn it into our hearts. Let us be captured by it and take it to the streets in whatever place you put us. We pray that you'd help us to thrive, give us the strength and courage to do so. And we look forward now to worshiping you in your presence. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.